What if you build a house without a connection to the city water and without a well? What, what's through that window over there, Steve? You get a 55,000 gallon water tank in your backyard. That is giant. This entire house that Steve designed is gonna run off one 55,000 gallon tank. So all rainwater everywhere, that's the only thing that's feeding this house. Now you guys have been here before. Steve and I made a video here not long ago about these awesome uh, European triple glazed, super efficient windows. Steve designed this house and I gotta tell you, Steve, we're in the mechanical phase, about to hit drywall, about to hit insulation. There's some killer details I'd love to show these guys, including rainwater. There is definitely some cool stuff happening out here and starting with that tank. High performance, Steve Basic House in Texas. Let's get going. Steve, we gotta hurry up this video because it looks to me like we got some rain coming. We're gonna start putting this tank to work today. <laughs> All right, so run through the basics of the system. I'm assuming our gutters are tied to this giant tank. Walk me through the process. So we have a bunch of PVC gutter work there. We kind of gave that industrial agricultural look. Mm -hmm. All of those gutters are interconnected. They come out here into a pipe, they fill the tank, and then as the water is called for there, there's a sensor in the basement. We have a small basement section that turns on the pump, but it's a uh, variable speed okay. pump. So depending on the demand, the pump here either races up or accelerates or decelerates. Gotcha. Is, is probably the best way to explain it. Now, the cool thing about water tanks when I was talking to the builder was, he said What's he's- the builder, by the way? Uh, native Construction. Native, okay. And Nick, who's the owner of Native Construction, says he, he's been in business for years and he's done a bunch of houses with wells and or, 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 or systems like this. And he said, the problem with wells is if the well dries up, you gotta dig, dig another well. Mm. This system here, he said he's never put in a water tank system where he's had a problem with. And he said, if you did have a problem, it's nothing more than backing up a truck and throwing in some water. I got a buddy that uh, lived on a ranch that was all rainwater. And when we had the severe droughts, he had to get a once a month or so dump. Uh, but since that drought that we had a few years ago, he's never had to fill up again. So that is a possibility, back a truck up and dump it. Now, do you know anything about the liner that's going on in here? No, but it, it, I mean, it looks just like, a, basically it looks like a pool liner. If you climb up, there's a yeah. little hatch there and the pump goes across the bottom of mm -hmm. the floor of it. But it's, it's basically just a round swimming pool, that's above ground pool that you're not swimming in. And did a rainwater collection contractor size this 55? Was that a homeowner decision? Yeah, I think it's based on what type of plumbing fixtures and what type of demand sequence that the, the homeowners said, you know, we would typically do this and that, and then we'd set up this system. That's pretty wild. We'll put a link in the description to all those folks yeah. that we, uh, we'll do a little research on that since I don't know those answers. I'll put that in the description below. But it's interesting how this is really just kind of PVC plumbing pipe and it's painted silver to look cool. But this is just, it looks like a standard eight inch schedule 40 PVC and all the yep. downspouts look like standard four or six inch PVC. Yeah, those are, I think, yeah, four inch pipe. And was the metal roof uh, a plus on the system or a must have on I the think, system? Um, I don't think it's a must have. I think you could have, we could have done asphalt roof. The interesting thing about the roofs are that the first hundred gallons of water that the system sees gets ejected between the house and here. Okay, there's a first so flush it system. So it, it's a flush system that goes out and it de deposits it into a tank. And then when that tank fills up, the, the system recognizes it, it switches the valve and starts throwing the water over here. That said, if you had any debris or an, anything that you didn't want in your water on the roof, that first 100 gallons or so cleans the roof basically yeah. and puts cleaner water into the system. And then when it goes back, there's a whole series of filters. So, you know, my guess is, is the water probably comes out of there and out of your faucet cleaner than if you were hooked up to city water. So architect question for you, did you specifically design the roof line for catchment? Uh, or was it, was this kind of a, hey, we would like to do this after all, and the roof line was already kind of set? This was always part of the system, but the, the roof line is, is probably a mix of capturing the water, but also just being able to handle long-term durability, simple mm -hmm. roof lines, yeah. which I always strive for. Yeah. 
and it's that kind of agricultural aesthetic. We're not we're not downtown Austin here on an infill lot. Right. We're we're spread amongst you know a dozen houses there's a, there's on a cow hundreds of acres. feet from us right yeah. over here. <laughs> you know, walking around. So ha having this, it's like you drive by and go, oh, they must have a few animals out back yeah, or something. It feels like an agricultural. It, exactly. Yeah. So. And I would compliment you as a builder on the roof line. I love the over, you know, pretty basic overhang. Looks like a one or an 18 inch overhang. Nice pitch. It's enough pitch too, though, that you've got some attic space. Yep. It looks to me like maybe it's a 612 pitch, a 45 degree roof. Yep. And then also the gables that Steve's got on there allow the contractors to poke out vents, uh, air intakes. I'm guessing that's the zender intake and exhaust on this gable Those right here. Those are the here. zender intakes. They usually need about a 10 foot displacement. And they also have an umbrella over them because they overhang on that gable. So that, that good and in some respects simple architecture lends itself to a really well built house. Yeah. And, I, and you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting that you, know, you bring that up because you get a lot of clients. They just want to cake the makeup on their house. Mm. And it's like, you know, just just keep it simple. The I, I'll, I'll go to my grave saying the hardest thing for a client is to keep it simple. Yeah, that's they right. always want to muddy the waters. Do you think yeah. we can add some trim? Can we put a dormer there? Can we add another <laughs> gabled roof that, you know, goes on? Can we bump that wall out two feet? And as a builder, the more valleys I see, the more dormers I see, I see sidewall flashing, I see kickouts. Uh, this roof, it's simple. You know, you look at the drone shot from this and straight above it, it doesn't look like it's super complicated but you also if you go to the drone shot i don't see a single vent penetrating the roof because the builder has plenty of gable space to pop those all out so that means that roof that should be a you know 75 year roof is legitimately going to go that 75 years without a leak without yeah. a problem yeah the, the and that's what these homeowners the homeowners that come to me that's what they're looking for they're like steve we we lived in a house that was nothing but problems mm -hmm. right we want a house that doesn't have problems i love it dude. we want to solve that from the beginning not not perpetually trying to solve solutions. Yeah. I feel the but, rain. <laughs> but it's, it's coming. It's coming. I'll meet for you sure. guys in the basement. Uh, we have a surprise guest, and let's see how this pump system gets into the house. I'll this, see you down there. This couldn't be any more perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's the tank we were just at, and we've got a line running through the ground. This house is a little unusual. We've got a, a bit of a basement. Steve designed a small mechanical space basement and a little bit of a root cellar style for the homeowner. And I got a little special surprise for you. Eric Audi's down here. What's up, dude? How's it going, man? <laughs> Y'all know Eric, right? He's a uh, mechanical contractor plumber in Minnesota, and he's actually in town for my birthday party. So we we're visiting this job site, and I said, man, it would be awesome to have you, Eric, explain how this rainwater input works. So talk me through this, Eric. Yeah, so think of a, think of a drilled well, right? But instead of having that well submerged down in the ground, we've got that giant tank, which you got to see, which is really cool, right? Pretty awesome. Yeah, so out in that tank, though, is a pump, just like a well pump. It looked just like a traditional submersible well pump. Yeah, it's connected to this box here. This is called a pump controller. Okay. Uh, it's a digital kind of like a variable speed control. Okay. It's got a sensor down here, right here on the plumbing. So the plumbing, the PVC line here is coming from that tank, that so one inch line. This line's coming from the tank and then is coming up. And this... Uh, how does it sense that, or what, what happens to, to change the pressure? So it's a millivolt sensor. It's a pretty technical sensor. And this is going to be pre-charged with a certain amount of air in it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be filled with water from the pump, Got okay, it. from the tank outside. Mm -hmm. And so this is really just going to kind of try to equalize the pressure and flow through the system based off of the pressure drop at that little sensor. So if you turn on a faucet, that sensor is going to say, hey, hey, to that control. Uh, Pressure's dropping. Uh, It'll turn the pump on. The pump will start to spin kind of at a slow pace and try to maintain the pre-programmed pressure at the controller. Is that similar to what a tankless water heater uses to kind of sense flow or is it a little different? I mean, the concept and what it's doing is sort of the same, but mechanically, no. It's, totally it's a pressure sensor instead of a turbine, like a, a, a flow sensor. Okay, gotcha. So the pump's way back there. This is talking to it. And then what happens from here? Walk me through that. Yeah, so when this is... This, this is a cleaning, like filtering system for the water coming out of that tank. 
okay? That's rainwater collected off the roof, piped over there, stored in there. There's going to be some sediment and some mm -hmm. stuff like that. We don't want going out and it's not purified yet. Yep. That's what this is going to do. You've got, I was checking this out. It's pretty cool. So you've got a sediment filter first. Okay. Then you have a carbon filter, which is going to be your taste and odor. It's going okay. to really clean that water. Wow. After that though, is a really cool UV light filter. So that UV filtration is what's going to purify the water and make it safe to drink. Did the stainless tank give it away that there was UV light in there rather than BBC? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It so, would break of course, it down. yeah, exactly. So, we don't want that UV on the uh, most plastics, you yeah. know, that we're going to use for our plumbing. Interesting. So, it's filtered, it's carbon filtration for taste. Then there's some type of purification happening with that UV. Yep. And then we're ready to send it to the house. Yeah, right here is just going out to the house and it's going to go to a manifold where they've got PEX run throughout the entire house. Pretty straightforward. There's nothing to it. How often do you think they're going to have to mess with maintenance on these? That's a good question. I don't actually know what how the intervals would be. I, I suppose it's going to, like everything like this, vary. it's going to vary based off of how many people are in the house, sure. how much water you're using every single day. That but kind of thing. maybe a couple months or six months or a year? You know, systems like this, probably something like six months, six month intervals. But to be honest with you, these are very, these are standard cartridges. Oh, okay. So they're not yeah, going to be. This looks like the standard filter wrench size. Yeah. So they're not going to be significant only to this brand. So right. I know that they're going to have options for maintenance down the road. It's probably not that hard to do. That is a great point though. Anytime you do anything in houses, we're always experimenting a little bit. Yep. And even though the manufacturer says, oh, this filter is good for six months. They don't know that you're in Texas or Connecticut or Minnesota. They don't know what your water looks like. So it's always smart when you're finishing a project, tell your clients, hey, check them early. Don't wait for the full time. Yeah. See what it looks like. Uh, and maybe you can go no problem six months, but maybe you actually need a three month cycle. Yeah, when you have more people in your house, it's gonna be probably shorter intervals than if you had you know, five people versus two people. Good stuff, man. Good yeah. seeing you, brother. Let's go back upstairs and I got another surprise for you. All right, so Eric and Steve both came into town for my 50th birthday, and guess who else is here? Jake Bruton. Hey, Happy dude, how birthday. are you? Good. Thank man. you. So, Jake, last time I was here, this was a concrete slab, but now there's Advantec down. What's going on with this house? What does Steve design here? So this is actually something that we've done quite a few times on our project. Steve and I have two houses going right now that we're doing the same thing. We are simple turndown slab, or this is maybe a post-tension slab. Mm -hmm. And now we have the ability to be insulated on the top side. So that insulation didn't have to go in before the concrete guys got here and then them not mess it up while they're... And then we have two layers of subfloor. So there's no stringers or, or furring strips or anything like that underneath here. It's literally raft of insulation, raft of, of Advantech. Here they've cut it around all the walls. Looks like they did a, the majority of their framing first and then yeah, came back. Yeah. There's some point loads and things like that. Sure. In a bunch of ours, all this is open span, all this goes in, and then these are all non-load bearing partitions so that they can sit on top of this. Yep. It feels like a, a wood frame floor because it, it is a soft It feels good floor. underfoot. Yep. Uh, now, we, now we have a slab on grade house that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. We have a slab on grade house that has a warm floor. We have a house that now we can do traditional hardwood flooring installation. I on. like that a lot. But I think the, the, the coolest things for me are like, we can, at an exterior door, we can omit the top layer of Advantech and now we have a drop sill for where our door's gonna sit. Yeah, that's now that door, can be, right that door can sit three quarters of an inch lower than the floor mm -hmm. and we can flash and have a back dam built into that door assembly and we're not trying to put a piece of metal there that's a thermal bridge. Or in our shower locations, there's a couple tile showers in the back side of this house, those showers, we have five inches of stuff to deal with here that we can just drop and now we can pour a pan, we can set, we can do zero entry in a much easier assembly. If you're doing zero entry on a slab on grade, you're boxing out a section of the slab that has to be lower and now it's the, yeah. is it in the right spot? Did it happen correctly? Did they even get it at the right elevation? You know, the, all those sorts of things. It really solves a lot it of makes problems. makes things easier. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're paying for two layers of Advantec that you weren't paying for before. Yep. But you're paying for the same amount of insulation. Yeah. So it's it's just the Advantec and the install. And the builders tell me this is R10 on top of the slab, so around two inches or so of slab top insulation. And then, as you mentioned earlier, two layers of three quarter Advantec. Now remember, you got to put those opposite each other. They're not they're not straight on top of each other. They're at a, at a uh, 90 degree angle to each other, and they are glued and screwed typically to each other. So this is actually a floating floor. We're not actually screwed down to the concrete. 
And crazy enough, I've seen Jake do this without a slab underneath it even. Yep. Now this, we don't want to get it too far into the weeds, <laughs> but if you don't realize, Jake is shooting videos over on thebuildshow.com, buildshownetwork.com. Go check out some of his older videos. He's been shooting now for two years. He's one of the OG contributors. Uh, man, I got to tell you on camera, I've learned so much from you over the years. And when I built my personal house, I used a bunch of details that I never saw anybody do till I saw Jake Bruton do them. All right, we'll see you in a minute. All right, guys, let me introduce you to Kevin Burke from Serious Fresh Air. Kevin, you are the Texas Zender America guy, right? Correct. Uh, and your team uh, both sells the equipment, but also you guys do some installs. We do some installs, and we're going to be doing some servicing as I build my uh, distributorship here in Texas. Love it. Now, this house actually has two of these bad boys going in, doesn't Correct. it? Correct. Yeah, so one of the things about Zender is we have different size units mm -hmm. to meet different needs. So this home required two separate ERVs and we were able to accomplish because it has two zones mm -hmm. and we were able to accomplish the servicing of those zones with two Q350s. Okay so this is the same cabinet size as the 600 that I have at my house but a little smaller guts is that it, right? It's the same size the difference between your 600 and this 350 is that this is squared off and we don't have this option on yours of changing the Ooh. direction. Oh, that's neat. Of these. How cool. Yours just go straight up. Okay. It's a little bit larger for the core and for the fans gotcha. for your machine. Your machine moves 220 CFM. This machine moves 120 CFM, continuous. It can boost up to 210. Okay, quite a bit. So, and yours can boost up to 330. So if you haven't seen our Zender Fresh Air videos before, let me, let me boil it down into, into the, kind of the three-minute version. On this house... Uh, we built it very tight. The builder's doing a great job. Steve designed a very tight house. So we want fresh air to come in because we're not having air leak in through windows, through various cracks and crevices. So this unit is going to do all our fresh air. Instead of a return air fresh air like it's pretty common in Texas or maybe bringing the fresh air in through the dehumidifier, this unit's doing all the fresh air. This unit also is doing all our exhausting in the house. So there's no fart fans anywhere in the house. You don't have a shower fart fan or a fart fan in the uh, uh, in the bathrooms, or pardon me, in the toilet room areas. This does everything. And what's cool about it is it's a balanced system. And beyond that, the core on this unit, this is an ERV, an energy recovery ventilator. When the streams of air pass near each other in the core here, the outgoing air, the extract air, and the fresh air that's pushing in, this thing is so efficient, it's around, what, 90% efficient or so? For sensible, about 88 to 90, and for latent, about 70 to 75%. Okay. So that average comes out to be about 82, I think, for both latent uh, heat and for sensible heat. And in nerd speak, that means the moisture, meaning it's maybe humid outside today, so we're going to reject some of that humidity. And sensible, meaning just the, what we feel, what we sense the temperature to be. So it's even more efficient on with the heat, basically. And then the moisture, it's slightly less efficient. But this unit is going to be running 24-7, 365. So we can eliminate all those bath fans. Now, one misconception that it's worth clearing up, Kevin, is this isn't doing anything for our kitchen exhaust venting, right? It's not talking to that It system. is not. Now, what we, we don't ventilate our kitchen range tops with an ERV. We are providing some extract in the kitchen for just mm -hmm. general moisture, but it yep. is not intended to be the range hood ventil uh, ventilation. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I'd like to see, I, I think you guys have some new um, ports or uh, We have or some new register rather. covers. Yes. Uh, do you have some of those on site? I do, I we have them over here. Let's go check those out, guys. So as we're walking, Look above my head and you're going to see all these white tubes around the house. I like to jokingly call them shop vac tubes. And they have some white tubes and they have gray tubes, kind of depending on your situation. But in effect, those tubes run from locations where you're either like these supplying fresh air or extracting fresh air in a home run fashion. So no break in the tube all the way back to where the Zender system is. And this round one, I don't think I've seen before, Kevin. What are we looking at here? All right, so this, this is our standard register, but in this register, we have different valves that we can use. So 
uh, in, in Matt's house, for example, he has these Luna valves. Mm -hmm. And so this is an extract valve, and I, I can pull it apart. And you can tell it's an extract because it's got a bell shape. This is a European design to make it quieter as it's moving air. I can't hear a thing out of my system, whether it's on high or regular speed. Right, and we can adjust the flow of air by adjusting this wheel right here. And so this wheel allows us to tune how much air is being pulled into this register. Yep. Now, hey, you got a new one though. This we is have what, an option here. I thought that was pretty cool. And so for, for decorative purposes, we can put this register cover on. We have a damper set that we use to adjust the flow of air coming through these. That's pretty cool. That's a nice looking uh, grill right there. So that could be on the sidewall. That could be in the yep, ceiling, right. and yep. you don't have it here, but I saw the other day at a trade show, y'all make a rectangular one as well. So right. if, if you don't like the look of the, what I call a kind of smoke detector looking Lunas that I used at my house, you could use these, which look slightly more normal. These may be slightly more expensive, but not terrible. Yeah, it's actually not, not much more at all. A um, little bit more difficult to commission for me, yep. these, but uh, we can do it. Now, he said something there that I want to comment on, but I don't want to take the whole video up on Zender. Uh, that's the thing I really like about Zender is there's commissioning involved. Kevin and his team have been trained. Uh, other parts of the country, you actually get a Zender person with a Zender America shirt on to come and commission your system. So at this install time, Kevin and his crew, they didn't actually care how long those shot back hoses were. It didn't matter because when he comes to commission the system, at the termination, whether it's an extract or whether it's a supply, these can be adjusted and he's gonna use a flow hood on there to say, okay, this room was supposed to have, let's say this girl's bedroom over here, 20 CFM of fresh air all night long while my daughter's sleeping. While the system's running, let's check the flow hood. Oh, it's at 25 CFM, I'm gonna dial it down. We're gonna drop it down a little bit or we're gonna open it up and get it within 10% or so, maybe 15% of that design value. So. These systems are awesome. Let's close out the fresh air system though and talk about cost for a minute. Um, I had a great conversation with a Zender rep the other day who enlightened me to, you know, I get a lot of pushback sometimes that these are more expensive than standard ERV systems. They're really not. These fresh air systems and especially these super efficient ones like the Q, if you just look at the box, they're a little bit more expensive, but on the order of maybe $1,500 more than a competitor's unit or $2,000 more for literally the world's best, most efficient system. What's different about Zender though is all this distribution system. Most people when they do an ERV, the HVAC contractor just comes out and figures it out on site. And you don't see that cost for that distribution system because it's baked into a bid or maybe it's part of your duct work or maybe they're just dumping it into your trunk line. So yes, you get some fresh air, but it's nowhere near the level of detail that you get with a Zender. And that's what I love about the system at my house. Every single one of my kids' bedrooms in my bedroom, I know when I'm sleeping all night long, I've got that puff of fresh filtered air coming into those places. So to boil it down on cost, I think for a single zone house, you know, a smaller house, 2,000 square feet or below, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think you're probably for the equipment itself talking maybe five-ish thousand dollars. Then the distribution system, another four or five thousand dollars. And you could install that yourself if you're a builder. You could even install it yourself if you're a homeowner. And if you want Kevin's team or another contractor to install it, if you kind of think about 50% of that cost is about what you'd pay in labor to have someone else do it, that's probably a good starting point. So in effect, a single zone system for a you know, normal sized American house, maybe 15,000 bucks, something like that, for the literally the world's best system that's gonna give you the best filtered fresh air in your house. Seems to me like a no brainer, but you need to budget for it ahead of time. Bigger house like this, we've got two zones, it might be more than that. Is that a, is that a fair assessment, I think Kevin? that's a fair assessment, yes. With that being said, let's go find Steve. We got a couple other details I wanna show you over here. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it, brother. Appreciate it. Steve. Beautiful house, man. So fun to have Eric and Jake out to see this construction too. It's you're, awesome. in the, you're in the mechanical phase. Looks like the installation contractor is about to do insulation. Uh, what are you doing for insulation on this house? We have, it's a hot roof. We are gonna do some spray foam up there. We're doing some blown in insulation 
In the wall cavity, we have the Zip R6 system. On the outside, we have R10 below our feet, so we've maintained continuity in our thermal envelope. So they should be really good out here in the plains of yeah, Texas. Yeah, and these windows are like R6 probably or something. Yeah. So every bit you've of got a really nice envelope here. We got a really good. It's impressive, man. It's Any final thoughts on the house or anything that you want to mention or point out? Well, just stay tuned because we got to have you back. We got a beautiful custom pivot door Ooh. for the front door that's cool. being made. And we got a Bari Hearthstone. It's a sealed combustion wood stove. It's one of these little barrel type oh, wow. that goes in the concentric pipe so that the wood stove doesn't communicate with the house. Oh. Everything happens internally. It's made in Germany. Oh, I want to see that. It's a great system. So. It, the cool stuff never ends. Man, I definitely want to see that, Steve. For years, I've been thinking about how to do a fireplace in the house, but I don't like that constant, I'm sucking air out of the house, or I can't get my fireplace to draw. So I'm guessing this pipe here must be some type of concentric. That's a concentric pipe that feeds the air to the combustion chamber, but then exhausts the bad stuff too. Ooh, that's going to be cool. At my house, I had to do an outside fireplace because I couldn't quite figure out how to do that. So. I'm excited to see that. Guys, if you're not currently following Steve, Jake, or Eric on buildshownetwork.com, go check out their videos. Really, really good content being produced by these guys. One new video every Did single week. Did you see week. the one where Eric cuts a hot water tank in half? <laughs> it's pretty cool, guys. We got great content. Actually, like 13 new videos now on buildshownetwork.com or thebuildshow.com goes to the same spot. Sign up for our newsletter in the link below. And then some of the things we talked about today, the Zender Fresh Air System, I'll put some info on the uh, rainwater collection. Uh, some of the products and things that you saw here, I'll put a link in the description so you can kind of see what we did here uh, and follow up on those. But if you're not currently a subscriber, follow us on Twitter or Instagram, no. Smash that subscribe button. We don't say Twitter anymore. We've, we've kind of abandoned that. Although I might come back to it now, frankly. Follow us on Instagram or TikTok. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show. Show.